University. This is Office Hours at Duke University. Today, Professor Maurice Wallace and graduate student Patrick Alexander are taking your questions about the portrayal and influence of prison in African American literature. Wallace is an associate professor of English and African and African American studies at Duke. He is the author of Constructing the Black Masculine and teaches a course on the films of Spike Lee. Also, he is co-editor of the forthcoming collection Pictures and Progress, Early Photography and the Making of African American Identity. Alexander is not only writing his dissertation on prison, pedagogy, and African American literature, but has also taught a literature class at a local prison for the past four summers. To ask a question of Professor Wallace or Patrick Alexander, send an email to live at duke.edu, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or post to the Duke University Facebook page. You can watch today's discussion again anytime on Duke On Demand. I'm James Todd from Duke's News Office, and I am here with Maurice Wallace, a professor of English and African and African American Studies at Duke, and also Patrick Alexander, a graduate student in the Department of English. So Professor Wallace, set the stage for us here in talking about this intersection of prison and African and African American literature. What uh, prime examples jump out to you? Well, I first want to thank you for having us and thank you. for um, allowing us the opportunity to share some of the conversations that Patrick and I have enjoyed recently, especially as it concern, concerns the work that he's done on his dissertation and some of the teaching that he's done apart from uh, his dissertation per se. But the subject of prisons and literature is um, almost a natural one, which is to say that um, and as much as I think about the history of African American literature, um, it's hard to imagine a historical moment in which um, prison, confinement, uh, and captivity have not been uh, the backdrop for some of that writing. In fact, um, there's a way in which the slave narrative of the 19th century uh, is something like the prototype for a more contemporary version of prison literature, 20th century versions of prison literature. So to the degree that captivity, confinement, um, and slavery are almost always a part of the unconscious of um, African American writing. Um, prisons have always, therefore, converged with. And prisons, I think, we simply want to identify as um, not only a real architecture and a real space for the restraint and containment of criminalized subjects, but we also imagine them uh, or imagine prisons as a trope for confinement, um, as a metaphor, an enduring theme in which um, African American writers particularly, or according to which African American writers in particular, have often represented what it means to be a black subject in the United States of America over the course of um, 400 years. And so what would be some examples that, that jump out to you? So so I think um, there are any number of writers I could I could point to who could sort of exemplify what it means to uh, bring prison to bear on uh, African American expressive culture. In the 20th century, I think probably the most important um, such writers would be um, figures like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, Everyone, of course, has at some point in his or her education had some exposure to Letter from a Birmingham Jail, for example, uh, a text that's worth repeating and rereading often. Uh, and I teach it regularly, and as does as does Patrick. Um, I think also there are lesser known figures, um, but major African American writers, nonetheless, um, like um, Etheridge Knight, who was himself. Uh, imprisoned in Illinois in the in the early 1960s and was discovered by another major African-American writer uh, Gwendolyn Brooks uh, author of Maud Martha and um, several other really important texts um, in fact um, I have 
uh, with me one of the shorter poems by Etheridge Knight. Would you read um, that so we get a, a flavor? It is. It is It is from his collection, Poems from Prison. And the particular poem that I want to share is called The Warden Said to Me the Other Day. And I, I want to read it precisely because it not only foregrounds the prison itself, the architecture and the reality of prison life, but it also alludes to the ways in which um, black subjects outside of prison also often imagine that experience as an, inc an incarcerating one. So um, the poem is entitled, The Warden Said to Me the Other Day. The Warden said to me the other day, innocently, I think, say, Etheridge, why come the black boys don't run off like the white boys do? I lowered my jaw and scratched my head and said, innocently, I think, well, sir, I ain't for sure, but I reckon it's because we ain't got nowhere to run to. Hmm. So there's obviously some wry humor there, but there is a really important critique that extends beyond uh, the confines of, of the prison. And so Etheridge Knight would be one of those um, figures himself having been incarcerated um, who writes out of that prison experience and um, gives us an ever more clearer sense of why it is important to think about uh, the history of incarceration um, and the expression of African-American literature. Um, Patrick and I have been talking more recently about the ways in which um, so-called neo-slave narratives, uh, those are narratives that imagine, reimagine what uh, experientially slavery was, but imagined a um, hundred years, two hundred years, a hundred years after the fact. Um, so you have you have um, writers like Toni Morrison, Charles Johnson, um, Shirley Ann Williams, um, and um, and others who, in the eighties and nineties are imagining the slave experience anew through fictional, fictional forms. And um, Patrick and I have been talking about the ways in which it seems pretty apparent to us that although the subject would seem to be slavery, there's a way in which um, the contemporary moment and the expansion of the prison industrial complex cannot escape association with these uh, representations of slavery. So. Um, it's still as it's still as contemporary as um, African American writers who are undertaking um, to represent and recast and reimagine slavery today as it was in the '60s when Etheridge Knight was was writing. So it's very much with us, and um, you know perhaps Patrick will will talk more about the immediacy of prison in our literature. Um, it's an immediacy that we often see not represented by prison life explicitly, but sometimes represented through the former historical experience of slavery. Um, and of course, we understand there to be some significant structural continuities between the slave past and the prison industrial present. I want to bring in a question from a viewer, and we've got uh, more than 100 people participating in office hours. And this question comes from Trey Andrea, and she's going to uh, push our genres a little bit here. Mm -hmm. And uh, she says, I wonder if Professor Wallace has a comment about the popular fiction of Donald Goines and Iceberg Slim. I know that not only did many of their novels take place in prison, but that many incarcerated men have found these popular representations of prison life to be compulsively readable. Of course, they are not, quote, literary novels, but it seems that they may also contribute to discourses about race, masculinity, and prison, especially in the popular and pulp imaginations. Yeah, I, I tend to agree um, with, with the comment. Um, Goins and um, Iceberg Slim had um, their, their, they were pretty popular writers in the, in the 70s, early 70s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they um, um, offer us a sense of realism that we don't technically get from the, um, from the writers who are high literary writers. Um, but 
I think it's important to bring these kinds of writers, these kinds of pulp representations of fiction into our conversations precisely because they lend a certain degree of realism that I think is important for us to appreciate because it's not easy to, um, and honestly perhaps not even ethical, to only imagine prison as this aestheticized space, right? It's this not is, just metaphorical. It's not just metaphorical. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps us to appreciate even uh, the more imaginative representations of, of prison. But not only that, these are, as all literature is, in my point of view, cultural artifacts, right? They are formed by and shaped within the history and the cultural specificities of any given um, historical moment. Uh, and so even if these, um, these two writers in particular aren't often on uh, the syllabi of persons who are teaching canonical African-American literature, I would hazard to say that they are um, getting ever more serious attention um, for the very reasons I, I expressed, but also, as I think this questioner has um, opened our understanding to, we are as interested in who reads what as we are in what we're reading. So to the degree that um, these two writers uh, allow us to get at what is precisely of interest in their works to incarcerated subjects and those who, who, who live outside of it, um, that's very revealing. What we, what we discovered there could be very revealing about, um, about our, our wider culture, about um, black American consciousness, about black American manhood, um, about um, the broader American uh, consciousness about freedom and unfreedom. Um, in a number of ways. So I, I think that we would all do well who, who teach African American literature to take these forms of representation, these, um, these, these writers, these works that have not accrued the same sort of institutional capital that um, the neo-slave writers I, I mentioned, for example, have. They are worth our attention. They're worth our study, as I said, not simply for the realism that is, is there and the caution it offers us um, against over-theorizing, of over-abstracting what is a violent experience for a great many um, of the incarcerated. Um, in fact, incarceration itself is a violence. Um, but um, I think um, that it's also worth our attention because it helps us understand um, I think better and in uh, from another point of view, what we deal with when we are thinking about reader reception, for example, who's reading what and why. Um, I have a, a, a colleague who uh, now teaches in Chicago, Jan Radway, who wrote um, a book a few years ago called Reading the Romance, in which she was interested in um, understanding why women were invested in the romance novel when for so many of us the representations of um, womanhood in these novels were not exactly progressive and yet they had they reached a wide and mass audience. We might ask the same thing about um, the kind of fiction, um, the pulp fiction represented by, by Goins and Slim. Great and uh, Patrick Alexander I want to bring you into this conversation. Everyone watching is also invited to participate in this Office Hours conversation on prison and African-American literature. Email is running a little slow at Duke this afternoon, so we were invited to tweet and post to Facebook your questions. We will work them in here. Uh, Patrick Alexander, you're a graduate student. Professor Wallace is uh, your dissertation advisor. You've got an interesting story. You're not only studying this topic, uh, how freedom, prison confinement shows up in African-American literature, uh, you actually, for the last four summers, have been teaching a course at a local prison. And for disclosure, we should say we, we, you and I did meet through, through prison ministry. Let's hear that story. How did the Stepping Stones course get started? Oh, absolutely. First of all, uh, I want to thank you uh, for having this opportunity for me thank to you. share about something that means so much to me and Dr. Wallace for being a part of this experience. It really means a lot to me. Um, Stepping Stones uh, began as... Um, a kind of listening 
for the frustrations of imprisoned students. Mm -hmm. um, a number of the men who I met through the visitation ministry at Orange Correctional Center in Hillsboro, North Carolina, uh, would mention that they, they love this opportunity to take college classes. Um, at, at Orange, um, UNC offers a, a variety of different courses that men there can take, and, and the courses were exhilarating and, and great, but they said, we're not performing well. You know, we're not, we're not living up to the potential that we think we have. Mm -hmm. And I would hear this every week, and, and um, I, I'm somebody who's very participatory in discourse, so I said, well, what do you, what do you plan you know, to kind of do about this? And they said, well, you know, you're at school, you know, you're at Duke, what are some of the resources that you have, some of the out-of-class resources that really, that really help you? And, and for me, it's, you know, we have the internet, they don't. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, we have professor office hours, <laughs> they don't. Um, and we also have a writing center, um, and they don't. And so um, listening to those conversations and I think having the opportunity to work you know, here at Duke at the writing studio and, and see, you know, experientially the effect that such, you know, an experience has on, on students here, I said, well, wouldn't it be something, you know, if some kind of a program uh, could be made there, you know, to help these guys in their college classes. And so it was really a dialogue between the men and, and myself. So I, I don't want to, I, I don't want it to be understood that this was something that I, I imported. This was actually something that uh, the men of Orange Correctional Center were always already reaching towards, and I kind of consider myself as a, a facilitator of that. So it began in uh, summer 2007, and uh, we're looking at a lot of the books that the guys are interested in. And what are um, those books? I mean, you brought some of them. Sure, I, I, I brought some from our uh, 2009 course. Uh, 2009 course was called uh, Visionary Voices, The Freedom Dreams of uh, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Barack Obama. And, um, you know, it came at a moment, you know, that had been the year that, you know, Obama's first year in office. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was it was an opportunity. The guy said, I really want to talk about, you know, Obama, but but we need to provide a history here. You know, mm -hmm. many of them explained, you know, uh, you know, my students of various ages, many of them said, you know, I marched, you know, with King, you know, so I, I, I want us to think anew about King and think anew about Malcolm X, you know. And so it's these um, these texts, right, that matter to them, that provide the, the central context for the course. Right. So every year while I'm building, um, helping to build skills like, you know, writing an argument paper, how you develop a thesis, um, how to do those those horrendous blue book exams, you know, um, we're reading books that they're invested in. Um, and the, so there's something very meaningful about being able to obtain some practical skills while also reading literature that means means a lot to you. Um, and so I, I've been doing that, you know, now for, for four years, and it's been a wonderful experience. And in terms of the effects of the Stepping Stones course, we've got a question by email here, and sure. it says, Sirs, what are the short and or long-range possibilities of this type of offering? In other words, is it possible to connect a program such as this to other social slash community agencies, which can help inmates transition back into the community with positive results? You've been teaching four years. You must have sure. seen some students that not only graduated from your course, but left prison altogether. Absolutely. You know, um, one of the hopes and one of the dreams that I have is, mm -hmm. is to see this program uh, become accredited in, in some kind of way so that um, students, uh, incarcerated students who always have a record with them, uh, might have some kind of leverage um, as they're applying to college. Um, also to sort of build relations with uh, community colleges um, because, again, many times we're working with the same kinds of skill sets. And so um, I, I hope to kind of um, think about what I'm doing as a kind of reverse cradle to prison pipeline, sort of like a prison to college pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm really, um, I'm really hoping um, for some new, some new um, investments from the community. It's also worth saying, I think, both Patrick and I have... Um, some, some intimate connections to um, the black religious community in and around Durham. And I think it's worth saying that um, um, so many of the religious institutions that seek to lend support to incarcerated persons um, frequently only imagine prison ministry as one thing. And I think what Patrick's labor has helped us to do is to imagine the ways in which prison ministry can exceed um, a weekly worship service. Um, however important that is, um, it is also important to provide 
uh, incarcerated persons with some practical um, resources that will help them hit the ground running um, when they're when they're released. Um, otherwise, I fear that without these um, really practical resources, we leave um, those who are finally find their way out of prison in circumstances that aren't entirely different from when they entered. Uh, Going back to and so we and absolutely mm -hmm. um, they find themselves in another uh, sort of carceral condition, yeah. um, and I think that um, the religious communities have as much of the a possibility for intervening here as any other um, not for profit organization uh, as the state and the like. So um, it's worth our thinking more broadly and more imaginatively about the ways that we do prison ministry, for example, and about the ways um, in which we offer resources to incarcerated persons on, on release. And I, I should say along those lines, um, one of the major supporters and funders of the work that I do um, in terms of like the texts, um, the teaching materials, pens, is Union Baptist Church, which is my worship home mm -hmm. here in Durham. Um, and so there are, there are certainly ways in which um, ministry and, and sort of more formal teaching mm -hmm. um, definitely interrelate with Stepping Stones. And talking about the Stepping Stones course, we actually have a, a recording of one of your students. Uh, this was a, a poem that he wrote uh, based on an assignment. And so uh, this is Lejean Holland, and let's give a listen to this poem. My name is Lejean Holland, and this is my response to the cover of The Independent. <clears throat> I stand on the shore of a great nation. I speak not for, but with the people that have made this our home what it is today. Listen, and you can hear the whisper of the many footsteps that trod through the sands of time. Listen, and you can hear the creak of the backs that bore so many burdens. I am the fruit of my ancestors' labors. I may appear to be solemn when, in fact, I have the face of solid determination, determination to do and determination to be a pillar of humanity. That is a poem, Lady Liberty, by Lejean Holland. He was a student in the Stepping Stones course taught by Patrick Alexander at the Orange Correctional Center. So Patrick, can you, can you tell this story? Who is Lejean? What was the assignment? Uh, did he get a good grade on it? <laughs> well, uh, Lejean Holland is um, uh, one of my students from the very first year that I taught Stepping Stones and um, honestly one of my, one of my favorite students. Um, Lejean um, has a great interest in creative writing and one of the other things that we do in the course in addition to sort of literary critical analysis is open up time for creative writing. Um, and so one of the assignments um, in this class was to have an attention to sensory detail. Um, and so we were very interested in thinking about the experiences of people outside of ourselves, um, but thinking about those in, in some very material ways. So seeing, hearing, touching, right? You know, and so um, Lejean's poem brings a lot of that out. Um, we were thinking in particular about um, a poem by Langston Hughes, you know, that America was never America to me. This cover of The Independent uh, came from uh, July 4th of, of 2007. And so we were, we were trying to, to think anew about freedom and mm -hmm. confinement, right, from the perspective of here a woman, right? And so that's, you know, the title here was Lady Liberty. And so there was a lot of um, interesting work um, that emerged from, from that um, course and Lejean's was was a wonderful poem. Lejean has actually gone on to um, do a number of, of of poems, and he he is a writer, and also is um, right now invested in some work in a in a documentary on prison reentry. Um, so um, Lejean's one of uh, one of the students I really really am inspired by. James, if I may, please. Uh, I also um, want to point out as um, that. Um, work has just reminded me that so many of the incarcerated persons who Patrick works with and whom I've had the occasion to to interface with are also themselves teachers and writers um, and one of the things that I think is so fascinating about the ways in which Patrick f has been able to bring his um, teaching 
and scholarship together is in attending to the ways in which um, his students have shaped, helped to shape the curriculum, right? As I think Patrick said earlier, it's not, it's not the case that he simply imported a curriculum, but in fact he was listening to the um, sort of criticisms and the suggestions of those whom he would teach. Now, it's our shared view, I think, that um, implicit in that um, alternative curriculum is in fact a significant critique that needs to be taken seriously on public education and education outside of um, the, um, um, the detention center, as it were, um, or whatever the case may be, uh, precisely because one might argue, and I think I would go to the mat on this, that part of, part of the failures, the systemic failures of education um, increase the chances that a, a, a person will find him, himself or herself incarcerated. Um, the, the thing about being incarcerated, I think, that the literature also reflects is that, um, that the, the, the experience lends itself to a great deal of in, introspection, a great deal of reflection. Mm. And so coming out of um, the, the time spent in reflection, are often some very good and serious um, critiques of what it is that we think we're doing um, outside of the detention center, especially in terms <coughs> of um, education. And 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 um, you know these these gentlemen would uh, would be um, sort of good persons to seek information on if we're thinking about, or trying to think imaginatively about educational <coughs> reform. But it's also worth, worth saying again that um, these men are writers, they're artists, and the curriculum that um, they've suggested and the curriculum that Patrick is responsible for helps them to be expressive in, in the variety of ways <coughs> in which they're already um, quite talented and quite quite gifted. That's also the reward of um, this of this experience. Um, in other words, there are plenty of other Etheridge Knights who wouldn't otherwise get an opportunity uh, to express themselves and to um, sort of lend their particular perspective on this body of prison literature that we're that we're talking about except for opportunities um, like this. So I'm especially pleased to know that <coughs> We are students every bit as much as they are students. Every bit as much as they may be learning something from us, we're learning a great deal from them. I certainly am, and it, it, it uh, bears on my teaching, um, and it bears on Patrick's teaching, and it bears on uh, the work that he's undertaking in his uh, dissertation. I think we want to pick up on that, that theme of pedagogy, but I want to get mm -hmm. to a viewer question here. We've got... Uh, 270 people participating in office hours here. And everyone who's watching is invited to join in this conversation on prison and African, African American literature. You can do that by tweeting, by posting to the Duke University Facebook page. Email is running a little slow this morning, so we're looking on Twitter and Facebook for questions. This Twitter question comes from Jeff. He says, Patrick, is there any work from the Western, quote, canon that unexpectedly resonates with prisoners? Hmm. Hmm. Shakespeare, I mean, with... Sure. Um, to be honest, um, there's, there's any number of, of works, um, and I, I would actually highly recommend, since you mentioned Shakespeare, um, a work by um, Jean Trunstein um, titled Shakespeare Behind Bars, hmm. uh, which actually provides some pedagogical context for um, another um, sort of a pedagogue in the prison space. Um, hmm. The work of Jean Trunstein is actually to bring the plays of Shakespeare um, to bear on a lot of um, carceral literature. So, I mean, there's 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 any number. Um, I'm I'm more um, I'm more um, right now sensitive to African American literary texts precisely because you know that's that's sort of what my uh, community of students are, are invested in. But but any number. I mean, I think it's also important to remember again. Uh, by highlighting the, the educational desires of those particular imprisoned audiences, um, one might find themselves reading 
new literature um, as a scholar or reading literature that you've never read before. So um, certainly the work of Shakespeare would, would, would be one of the many examples. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to pick up on, on pedagogy. You've been mentioning that. And uh, now we've been talking about just kind of walking into prison and teaching, but I mean, there are fences and barbed wires and guards, and, and, and there's, a, there's a real double power dynamic there. You're the teacher, but also you're, you're the free person. I mean, you get to walk right. out, and, right. and you have lots of privileges that the students don't. Um, can you talk about translating that back to a, a, a campus classroom? Um, you, you're talking to Professor Wallace about the sort of public education system. So what, what are reflections about teaching itself coming out of this? Right. Um, well, probably the biggest thing is that, um, you know, Prof. Wallace mentioned that we can learn, right, mm -hmm. from imprisoned students. Um, I have to be careful every week that I come in that I'm not sort of reinforcing the kind of regulatory or dis disciplinary politics that are always already at work in the prison space. Mm -hmm. um, so as I'm going in there and, and excited as I am to be able to teach, um, mm -hmm. I have to be aware of the fact that um, if I'm the exclusive pedagogue, if I'm the person who's always only teaching, um, I'm actually sort of constraining what might be a very liberating or, or expressive experience for my students. Um, so mm -hmm. perhaps one of the most um, rewarding experiences I had and, and experiences now that I take back with me in my, my pedagogy at Duke is, is actually having a student lead class for a session. Um, and that, that, was, that was a big deal for me, you know, because I said... I don't know what this is going to turn into. You know, I, I, I have outside of, you know, the ministry nights and outside of this, mm -hmm. this classroom context, I have no context for this prison space, right? Mm -hmm. And so many of my students interact in a variety of other contexts. So what might that mean, you know, for me as, as a pedagogue? Um, but I had a wonderful student my second year, uh, Darnell Stanley, who uh, was very invested in uh, a narrative by Nathan McCall uh, called Makes Me Want to Holler. Mm -hmm. And uh, he... Uh, talked to me well into the maybe maybe two or three weeks into the term um, about you know well four weeks from now um, you know I'm reading I'm reading makes me want to holler now and I really want to teach this okay. um, and I really would I love how you you do class but but would you mind having me lead that discussion mm -hmm. and uh, I was hesitant at first but um, we had some discussions you know during the ministry nights and he was very um, committed to this teaching and he came in. Um, led, taught in his own style. Um, and, what was that style? Um, it, was, it was a very sort of um, di dialogical from the start. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I tend to, to lecture a bit first mm -hmm. and then open it up, for, but it was, it was very dialogical from the start. Um, but, but what that actually did um, was allow for some students who ordinarily did not participate mm -hmm to participate, and in particular, some of the older gentlemen. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting that the text itself, uh, many of the men were very familiar with these carceral sites. Um, mm -hmm. Many of them are in Virginia, not, not far from here, so they've had people that they know, go, you know there or they themselves have been there. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the experiences resonated with some of the older men, and there was a way in which, dialogically, um, he was able to draw upon those experiences and help us um, to have more um, precise, close readings of that mm -hmm. text. And so, you know, I walked away from the class, you know, the classes run three, three hours, and it, it went incredibly fast. And, and I remember thinking, um, here, is, here is a real teacher, you know, and here's somebody I can learn from as a teacher. And so one of the things now that I add to my pedagogical toolkit is that, you know, I need to be sensitive to those students who um, not only have a propensity you know, for, you know, pedagogy and teaching, but, but have the desire and who are doing that work and who can not only teach students, but teach teachers. My takeaway, pedagogically speaking, from uh, interacting with the incarcerated students... And you have guest taught a number yes, of times, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. And have um, always, always been fulfilled by the experience, not least because um, the students themselves are so eager um, to offer something and to learn. Um, and I've always come away from those experiences um, being reminded of how important it is for me as a student to pose and think very seriously about the questions that I may be putting 
to a, to a class. Questions that are not always intended to elicit an immediate response. Sometimes there are questions that are intended to um, challenge our normative ways of thinking um, and questions that will always inevitably give me something back in return. What's a question you might ask to, to uh, a class in prison? Well, um, I, I suppose my, my previous experience, um, the most recent experience um, um, teaching um, Patrick students uh, had me have them think about Martin Luther King's last, um, uh, last uh, sermon speech in Memphis, Tennessee on the eve prior to his uh, assassination. And so some of the things that I am, I am interested in um, there and those students helped me to understand is the dynamics, say, between uh, King's preaching and his speaking and the reply of those who are listeners. So that while we generally take um, King to be the genius here, and of course he was, I, I wanted to pose questions that would have students think about our capacity as listeners to improve the speaker um, so that they understand that King's genius was in part a co-production, mm -hmm. right? And that we now, that the students now have the opportunity to improve the genius of Patrick, right? Um, and can be involved in the production of Patrick as a pedagogue. And so the kinds of questions have them to think about who was that in the background? What does it mean to, um, for some random audience member to speak back? What does it mean for this classroom to speak back to me in the moment of lecturing, right? Um, so these are questions that because these students have especially sensitive ears, they're hmm. hungry for this, um, they're, they're not distracted by laptops in the middle of a classroom <laughs> experience. Um, I'm a little sensitive about that. Um, they're, they're not distracted um, um, by a number of other students who are themselves distracted or fatigued and nodding off. They're really engaged and they understand themselves, I think, to um, be offering something here. Um, so these are kinds of questions, questions that um, challenge traditional and conventional and reflexive ways of thinking that don't necessarily um, accept textbook uh, answers or textbook replies, to have us think about um, King in, in new ways. Is King any less of a genius if indeed he plagiarized? There's good evidence to suggest that he did. Um, does that make him any less of a less of a of a of an important figure to us and what's the what's the line so these are these are the types of questions um that i might put to um that that class but but questions that make it seem okay at least not to accept things on face value um but to be more probing um and it's something that I've, i take very seriously in my classrooms which is to say that i invest as much time in trying to conceive of a question that is cast properly as I do in trying to theorize an answer. Because I think that the properly uh, posed question can be as productive as a simple sure. lecture with the answers. Um, and I know that some students are frustrated by it because they'd like me to simply give them what's gonna be on the exam. Um, that's what sometimes matters most. But that's, for me as a, as a, as a pedagogue, that's not what matters most. Um, what matters most is that I am pressing and, and, and probing and pushing um, persons to think critically and imaginatively in ways that they might not have been uh, afforded space to do previously. Okay. Well, we've got some co-production going on here. We've got a couple more tweets in with some questions. Everyone watching is invited to participate in this conversation by tweeting with the tag Duke Live or posting on the Duke University Facebook page. Damien asks, what role do you feel the Academy has to, can, play in ameliorating the adverse social effects of imprisonment? You want to start, Patrick? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Um, uh, 
Damien, I thank you for this question. And I thank you, Damien, for your support of Stepping Stones and for, for coming in um, this summer. We really enjoyed your contributions um, to our discussions. Um, I, I think that understanding that um, universities uh, play a role in the community, mm -hmm. right? And also um, sort of challenging our traditional notions of what community is, is precisely the kind of role that the university can play. And what, precisely what I mean by that is understanding that um, if, if I'm thinking about, I mean, terms like um, community engagement and, and, you know, they're, they're very popular right now, right? Mm -hmm. But what if we imagine community engagement not only to think about um, service learning in, in sort of um, neighboring communities, right? Uh, whether they be residential or, or, or shelters or, or things of that nature, but, but to also include the prison space, right? So um, I, I think it's, it's taking um, paradigms like stepping stones seriously and, and sort of um, working with um, folks across the disciplines, um, folks at various levels. I mean, we've got a number of graduate students I mentioned who have, who have come in and taught. Um, Prof. Wallace has come in and taught. And there's, there's, there's things that everyone um, in the university can do. Um, I, I think it really opens up, um, you know, when we think about community in a more inclusive way to include those people, mm -hmm. right, who are incarcerated, it actually opens up opportunities for, as I mentioned earlier, you know, for teaching, for, 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 uh, for graduates and, and even arguably undergraduate students. Mm -hmm. I got can I, another question here. So this one comes by uh, Twitter from Camille who asks, how does writing help politicize incarcerated students? Are they able to address themes of overcrowding, mandatory minimums, disproportionate sentencing, et cetera? Hmm. Political awareness. Um, I don't think that anyone uh, should be surprised that um, the students that we have in mind that we're talking about are um, profoundly politicized by the experience itself. Mm -hmm. um, Even before the course. It's, before the course, mm -hmm. yes, by virtue of their um, experience in the um, criminal justice system. There's, uh, there's some awareness, acute awareness of, of justice and injustice. There's an acute awareness of, of the differences between um, life in free society and um, the constraints and restrictions of life in an in a, in incarcerated society. Um, I think, in fact, that the politics of being incarcerated, um, insofar as um, incarcerated persons are allowed to, to write and to express themselves poetically, in prose, in spoken word, and the like, um, often surface in the most imaginative ways and therefore engage us in ways that um, we're unlikely to get otherwise because they're not afforded the kind of institutional capital that comes with um, being an academic um, and, and having a, a hearing um, in the School of, of Public Policy, for example. Um, they're not afforded um, the traditional ways of, they're not often afforded the traditional spaces for political expression. So, um, in, in the ways, in, in literary consciousness, in, in, in writing poetry, um, they're often, in spoken word, they're often able to give voice to these things, um, these experiences, their very real experiences, in imaginative ways. And um, I am sure that there are also, though I'm um, much less close um, to this, I'm sure that there are um, ways in which um, both inside and outside of these institutions, um, incarcerated subjects um, find the means by which to get others to listen very seriously um, to their concerns and to um, and to the politics of living in uh, an incarcerated setting. Perhaps um, Patrick would know more about that, but um, suffice it to say that as long as we take seriously, Patrick and I take mm -hmm. seriously, um, expressive representations of incarcerated life, then we have the means, and this is part of what Patrick's dissertation is about, we have the means to compel others mm 
by, by simple critical translation to compel others to take seriously what is expressively um, conveyed in a piece of uh, literature, in a piece of, uh, in, a, in an essay, in a poem, in a spoken word piece. These are themselves, I think, important political documents. Every bit as important as Letter to a, from a Birmingham Jail is, as important as we uh, understand that text to be, the productions of incarcerated subjects can be understood to be equally important, equally urgent, equally um, uh, revealing and, um, and strong political documents. Uh, the, the last three books on the syllabus uh, were, were all political, I mean, Patrick. Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, but I guess really thinking along the lines of, of you know, what Prof. Wallace has, has here raised, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's also, um, it's also about being sensitive to the kinds of questions, right, that, that incarcerated students raise mm -hmm. as, you know, I, I'm particularly interested in my dissertation in works of fiction, you know. So taking um, a work like uh, A Lesson Before Dying, uh, which I raised earlier, uh, I had a student who um, came in and told me and, and later developed a more, you know, uh, critical paper um, about um, uh, the experiences of, of Jefferson, who's mm -hmm. the, the incarcerated subject in that work. Um, and, and what was particularly of interest to him was how does Jefferson help to tell my story, right? Or help mm -hmm. to tell the stories of some of uh, my friends and, and colleagues here who are incarcerated in a way that um, is perhaps more authentic um, to our perspective than perhaps say what gets narrated in the news media, right? Um, or, or even arguably academic studies, right? Um, there's a way in which um, the imagination, again, you know, and sort of the, the sort of interaction that a lot of my incarcerated students have had with, you know, imaginative works um, enable some of these ways of thinking about, um, for one, prisoners as human beings, but, but secondarily, um, the complexity of, of imprisonment experiences. That um, imprisonment can be very dehumanizing and, and terrible, but that there are moments of transformation that not only there are moments of transformation, but there are, are moments of resistance. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the two can coexist. Um, I think that that, that has probably been um, some of the, the most revealing um, um, aspects you know, of, of my participation in Stepping Stones. I think this literature also <clears throat> offers students language mm -hmm. where they might not previously have um, the the um, the the words the um, words that are translatable outside of the the particular circumstances they find themselves mm -hmm. in right so what these what these texts do is offer a politicized language I think that can be drawn upon um, by these by these students and. Um, and can be integrated into the writing, integrated into the spoken and um, written expression. So um, I think that's as valuable as anything, which is to say that I'm not always persuaded that we are politicizing mm -hmm. as much as we are um, offering um, um, a set of ideas, a, let, a set of previous expressions mm -hmm. of political struggle um, that these students can latch on to, can grab hold of, and then um, bend the words and the ideas to their own to their own purposes. We've had a number of questions come in, so let me toss out the two at a time here. So uh, Marcus asks, Patrick, you characterized your work as a reverse cradle to prison pipeline. Have you had interaction with past students who have been quote liberated, and what was the nature of that interaction? And if I could toss one more out, uh, just so we can keep rolling here. And that one comes by uh, Facebook from Jeffrey, and he says, uh, is the increased privatization of prisons being reflected in prison literature? So, so one, on, uh, one on privatization sure. and one on liberation. Okay. Sure. Um, let, me, let me speak first to um, Marcus's question. Mm -hmm. And Marcus, I appreciate the question and all of your uh, support. Um, I'm, I'm particularly um, um, amazed by... Um, Another one of my first year students, um, uh, Michael Anderson, um, who, again, I mean, I, I, think, I think Prof. Wallace is right to say that the 
sort of creative capabilities of these <laughs> students were always already there. Um, the class is another form for these capabilities to be seen and expressed and understood. Uh, but he's a poet. And the class was something for him. Um, uh, it not only expanded his, you know, poetic palette, but he said, you know, um, I can think about college as a real possibility, mm -hmm. right? And, and Mike is an impressive poet. He's actually uh, published uh, a, a book of poems uh, since being released. Um, and so for me, it's, 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 it's both thinking about the possibility, yet, you know, that I can. Yes, I can do this. I can, mm -hmm. right, do college level work, but it's also opening up possibilities for other kinds of things, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I also impress upon my students that um, some of the things, uh, some of the skills that we're building, you know, uh, close reading, um, uh, you know, reading behind the lines, right, mm -hmm. are, are, are things that you will need in any profession, right, mm -hmm. to be able to, um, to understand the, 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 the politics, right? What's, what's behind, what's not revealed. And, and, and um, Mike Anderson is one of those students who, um, who's accomplished that kind of work. But again, I mean, I would emphasize that a number of students um, have gone on and taken college courses there offered on site and have, uh, you know, made, committed themselves to, to, to trying, you know, to get into college post-prison. Post and a thought on privatization, that was the other question I'm, here. I'm less certain about whether um, or how it, ref it manifests itself, that concern, in student writing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more persuaded, though, that, um, that it is ever more in the consciousness of um, established writers, the writers that I'm likely to teach in any given semester. Um, and as I said at the outset of our, our conversation, to the degree that um, African American writers, especially in the last um, 20 years, are having um, ever more difficult time shaking the memory of slavery, um, I cannot help but suspect that um, while their reflections are on the historical past, that implicit in those reflections is, in fact, uh, a comment on um, the the a comment on mass incarceration today, mm -hmm. and, and the privatization of and 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 the privatization of 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 prisons and detention centers, of course, is precisely what causes such a resonance between the present and the slave past. Um, so. Um, while slavery is, of course, while representations of slavery are, of course, um, in, an important means by which to really um, get at um, the absences of the slave experience that did not get documented, um, it's still every bit a function, I think, of our need to think about slavery now because if we don't get it right, if we don't think through it critically, we are in jeopardy of seeing something uh, realized that is not very far removed from that institution um, 100, 150 years ago. We've got a question here from uh, Cheryl who's going to push us a little bit. Uh, we're all men here, these students, it's an all-male correctional facility, and she asked, Patrick, can you comment on how your students' relationships with black women and mm -hmm. children have been affected as a result of their interaction with or new insights from this literature? And are you aware of similar programs working with women in prison? Sure. Um, I'm a bit less familiar with, mm -hmm. with programs, uh, women's programs, but I am um, particular to the kinds of, um, some of the, the new understandings um, of, of, of women mm -hmm. um, that have emerged as a result of some of our um, classroom activity. Um, one, of, one of the works that was chosen um, for our class was uh, an autobiography by Asada Shakur. Um, and there was a need in the course. And who was Asada Shakur? Just for uh, people, Asada for people Shakur watching. was a uh, Black Panther and, and later um, sort of kind of broke with, with Black Panther, but, but sort of a Black liberation uh, struggler. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she authored uh, an, an autobiography in 1987 uh, about her 
um, her experiences in incarceration, which included being placed in a male prison mm. um, in, in the 1970s. Um, but she, she, auth she authors this um, autobiography that in many ways um, sort of builds upon Angela Davis's uh, autobiography. Mm -hmm. um, but, but in the class, um, part of why the students selected that work um, was because they said, you know, we're reading about Malcolm, mm -hmm. right? We're reading about Etheridge, right? And, and we're reading about um, particular black male sort of, you know, revolutionary um, imprisoned subjects. Mm -hmm. But, you know, especially when you think about how the, the kind of role that women played, right, in mm -hmm. both the civil rights and black power movements, you know, what what did women have to say about this experience of incarceration? And, mm -hmm. and how might we understand that revolutionary history, right? And so, um, once again, I mean, I was, um, I was amazed by the level of engagement with the text and also the kinds of, um, the kinds of conversations um, that were sort of, you know, revealed, you know, the, the, the sort of um, experiences that, that family members, right, who, who either had been sisters, mothers who had been incarcerated or, or, or who knew of Asada Shakur, right, you know, that really... Um, I think elevated our discussion to a level so that it was not, you know, principally this masculine kind of a thing because prisons are, you know, very popularly represented as these masculine spaces and these masculine spaces, right, of transformation. Um, but but I, I really think that work in particular opened up a lot of new um, understandings about black women, both incarcerated and, and, and not. I, I appreciate that question uh, very much. Um, it it reminds me um, of another work that I should just mention, uh, and that's Shirley Ann Williams' novel, Dessa Rose. If my thesis about um, the importance of slave, neo-slave narratives having bearing on um, the prison industrial complex of our present moment, um, that text um, is an important one, not least because the protagonist is, not, le not only because the protagonist is a female um, who is a slave, um, but she is also, for a good portion of the novel, jailed. Um, and it seems to me to point to something that is also of concern um, to, to Patrick and me, and that is um, what we think of as the banality of, of abuse and violences enacted upon um, incarcerated bodies. Um, wherever we get um, black women's representations of incarceration, they're often more forthcoming about those abuses. So there's a great, but it's not to say that women are the only victims of institutional, institutional violence on incarcerated bodies. And so that text is one that for me is suggestive for persons who are, as, who are interested in um, thinking about um, prison literature, um, confinement, carcerality, and as I said, the banality of violence, such that um, they get over those violences, those abuses, um, are not are not seen, are not heard because they're banal, and because you know um, um, the representations of them um, can sometimes cannot be adequately conveyed by the page. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So um, these are important concerns, especially uh, especially the important concern because it's the women writers who offer us um, ways to imagine um, violence, institutional violence, um, official state violence on incarcerated bodies in ways that are more problematic for um, for the male subjects. Um, but I just wanted to refer to that text in, in particular. Um, and then, of course, Asada Shakur and Angela Davis and, um, and, and others who are critical, I think, to this discussion um, because gender is an issue that um, inevitably bears on um, the history of uh, representations of confinement and captivity uh, in, in our tradition. We are coming up on the very end of this office hour. And uh, so, so to wrap this up, um, what about, is there, is there a reading, a, a passage? Uh, you've already read uh, one of the Etheridge poems and uh, 
Patrick, you've got um, <laughs> probably about 50 <laughs> passages marked there. Right. Um, is there uh, a passage that, that stands out that uh, you could even read now or at least direct people to? Um, I, I will um, point out um, Malcolm X's autobiography and mm -hmm. especially thinking of all of the you know, discussions we've had about education. Malcolm X is one who um, did an enormous uh, amount of reading, um, reading not only um, in, in the sort of um, practical sense, but in the political sense, mm -hmm. um, while incarcerated. And so I, I'd kind of like to, to raise um, one of the more famous lines um, from, from, his, from his work as a way of, of closing. No university would ask any student to devour literature as I did when this new world opened to me in prison of being able to read and understand. All right, all right, that's a good word. Maurice Wallace, a professor of English and African and African American studies here at Duke. Patrick Alexander, a graduate study in Duke's Department of English and uh, the instructor uh, of the Stepping Stones course at Orange Correctional Center in Hillsboro. Thank you both for uh, coming on Office Hours. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can watch this conversation again anytime on Duke On Demand. Watch Duke On Demand. OnDemand.duke.edu This week on Duke On Demand, Duke alumnus Yi Zung Hee gets a master class lesson and Duke's Baldwin Auditorium from concert pianist and visiting artist Awadajin Pratt. That work, I mean, you put the pedal down, it's for not, for not, yeah? How about just that pedal? Try it, it sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Also this week, Professor Misha Angrist discusses the science behind and experience of having his entire genome sequenced. A conversation at Duke's John Hope Franklin Center on the local food movement in Durham. And an Office Hours webcast conversation on prison and African American literature. On demand. Duke. Dot edu.